Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and here to answer your questions tonight, the Executive Director of the New Democracy Foundation, Ian Walker, Political Editor of the Australian Financial Review, Laura Tingle, American writer and visiting fellow at the Lowy Institute, James Fallows. Author George Megalogenis, whose quarterly essay argues political inertia is putting Australia's prosperity at risk. And broadcaster and journalist turned state cabinet minister, Prue Goward. Please welcome our panel. Thank you, and you can watch Q&A live across Australia on ABC TV and ABC News 24 and listen on News Radio. Well, tomorrow all eyes will be on the Parliament as the Federal Treasurer delivers his first budget, setting the agenda for the nation and for the forthcoming election. Tonight we're asking whether our political system is really capable of delivering the policies and reform we need. We'll go straight to our first question. It's from Greg Vaines. Thanks, Tony. After years of positive economic growth, I'm worried that Australia has become a complacent country and that without significant economic reform, we will inevitably head into recession. The Hawke-Keating era, as well as the early years of the Howard government, saw significant e economic reform, but since the introduction of the GST in 2000, there have been minimal significant reforms. In fact, none come to mind. What has to be done to get our political leaders to lead the country and make the tough decisions so that we avoid a major economic recession. Uh, Ian, in because, um, well, from your perspective, yeah. um, the citizens don't seem to be getting a say uh, in making these changes or in advising governments on these changes. You're right. We hear a lot about citizens having a say and, and governments saying we will consult the community. They tend to hear from a fairly noisy, self-selected part of the community. And we tend to differentiate and encourage governments to think there is community, there are community groups, they're two quite different audiences. Um, as James mentioned, polarisation. I heard uh, Greg's question originally about how do you get that reform, reform appetite. On any given reform question, you're going to see a bell curve distribution of views. Government today hears from one side that says you absolutely must do this, one side that says the world will end if you do what they want. And we're very, very much struggling to find those views across the middle. And that's what we see as the challenge. The problem is not a lack of leadership. The problem is actually not bad politicians. It's an invidious job made tougher by, by people like me sitting here and doing this. And it's from that point we say, well, actually, how do we empower leaders to lead? And that's how we look at the, the challenge. The challenge is not leadership. The challenge is the primacy of public opinion. We've uh, got a lot of questions, um, some from very young voters, which is great. Nadia Sujangi has a question. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. The challenge I believe we face in the 21st century is that our society tends to enjoy sensationalism and drama over facts. Democracy is about people collectively making decisions, but many Australians are not engaging with the facts to inform their decision making about our government. Do you think that this inhibits politicians being able to make tough decisions and inhibits our country growing into a better nation? Let's start with Ian Walker. Fantastic question, Nadia. It's, I don't know how we staged it, but thank you. There's a wonderful thing called rational ignorance, and it's this. When you're one sixteen millionth of a vote, your incentive to read an IPCC report, a Ken Henry's tax review, your incentive is very small, and the rational choice is to go out, do whatever you like to do on the weekend, do something with your family. The rational choice is not to read the information, and it never will be. In fact, when you go back to some of the prior questions as well, we have built a system that responds really well to slogans. We're going to see a lot of advertising we don't like, and we're going to see it, these political ads, because they work so well. We've built a system based on voting for the person you hate less. That's where we actually start to look at creating... <laughs> we actually need to start to look at creating something where we do create the incentives, and that's where we look at the structural change. And part of it is trusting sampling. You know, part of it's trusting different methodologies. We're going to trust a criminal jury to lock people up for 25 years. You know why we trust them? In my view, it's because it's a random mix from people from all walks of life. They look at all the information, just 12 of them, but there's no outside incentives. There's no, well, in, as in the American case, do you really want to elect judges? No, because we look at the election and says that impairs judgment. When we look at that, that small group of people look at a lot of information, find common ground, and report that back to a judge. I think there's something to be learned that we've got structural impediments to people learning and reading. The only way we're going to get around it 
16 million people are never going to read everything, otherwise we might live in a slightly dull place. Ian, you might as well explain, um, now that you've got onto the idea of juries, that uh, your New Democracy Foundation does actually champion the idea of citizen juries dealing with policy issues. It's working already in some local government areas. The Victorian state government is also taking it on board. How does it work very briefly so that the others can consider this? Certainly. Uh, the brief idea is that we think there's a complementary role for randomly selected everyday people. This recognises that the elected tier have a fantastically hard job. It's absolutely hard to be subject to that kind of insight, well, insight, subject to that kind of focus and criticism so often. A randomly selected group of everyday people are given a challenge or a question, how can we pay for the health system we want? And from that point, if they can actually spend five months, six Saturdays, so 50 hours on an issue, this fits really well when someone's view will change on a topic between their two-minute opinion poll view or if I immerse you into that issue for 50, 60 hours across three months, you get access to sources of your choosing, will your view change? And the addition of information is often pretty rare and we see these transformative effects from local councils through state authorities such as Infrastructure Victoria. Not to decide issues, but to advise on what people are thinking about them. Is that I how you... I think, almost going back to the first reform question, right now the, the room to move is a very, very small box. If you ask a group of citizens how they may solve that and they find common ground, they'll come back with a dozen ways they might be happy to see that solved. And that simply comes back to a parliament. And because it hasn't come from a t particular lobby group, it doesn't get the reflexive opposition. And simply put, it expands the array of choices a government of either persuasion can choose from. And it's about broadening that scope of action from what is a very small paddock at the moment. Laura, just right, let's go uh, yeah. to the rest of the panel. We'll come back to the Australian issues as well, uh, Ian. Look, the Trump jumping off point is an obvious one. And it's every presidential election. People say it's crazier than ever. It can't get worse. And I think people in some ways see Trump as an end point. And I'd encourage them to reflect that Kanye West has declared his intent for presidential <laughs> run in 2020. So it can get crazier and it points to the systemic issue. It actually goes to Courtney's question earlier, one I hope everyone running for office watches again because if my eyesight's any good, you're in a school uniform, so you're not yet voting. And you've picked that we have an insider's problem. And it actually came to each of the points we've heard here. We have a system that is skewed that benefits those inside. We did a little bit of Excel analysis on the 220-odd uh, people in our federal parliament. 226, I should say. It's based on the last parliament. Have they had more than five years' experience in a non-paid political job? Have they been student politicians? Have they worked as a political advisor? Knock those three criteria out. Do you want to know what that number is? It's only a tick over 20. It's actually a very small number. And it makes sense. These are not bad people. But if you've got an intent, as you might, to run for office, your smart play is to work inside a minister's office. It's to understand the network and the contacts. We have built a system, all systems will tend towards a little professionalism. So we're not saying get it out, throw out. I do have a slightly radical backer, Luca would throw everyone out. But on a, on a more nuanced side, we could potentially go down a path of saying, what are the counterbalances we could put on so that those with incentives, we also hear a separate voice from those who aren't subject to the electioneering imperative. And that's that balancing point I think we need to look for. Yeah, Laura, I'll bring you in. Um, <laughs> the first part. Yeah. To go to the original questioner, yeah. Yeah. I don't think citizens are selfish. <laughs> I think we've built a fairly simplistic system. And it's, if you look at voting ads on television, they're a lot like how you would buy <laughs> Coca-Cola or Doritos. It's low involvement, quick response, and that's what we get. We have a little bit of choice and we respond to that choice. And there's a temptation always to come back to why has the tone and tenor of debate been lowered? Because there's a bunch of analysts to sit there and look at the results and say, this works really well. If you wanted to win and retain office, it's not about the people. You could have Mother Teresa running for Prime Minister. She would run the same horrendous attack ads we're about to see because they work really well. You've got to stop getting past, stop blaming the people in those offices and start thinking we need to just trial some new things. All right. And, and, and I think... Well, the next question is from uh, Lauren Milanos. Rejecting New Zealand's offer to take 150 refugees is a poor attempt at lessening the success of people smugglers. People do not seek asylum because a people smuggler convinced them through effective marketing. The only way to lower the amount of ref refugees produced globally, globally is to end the conflict in their country of origin. When can we stop purposefully denying existing refugees their futures simply to use them as a deterrent? and help them as is every developed country's duty. Ian, what do you think? 
One of those classic issues where all courses of action open to a government will be criticised. Now we've seen through a number of years, uh, through Kevin Rudd taking an effectively uh, opposite position to that which we see today, and it was a continual uh, item of criticism. Some things are just hard. We look at crime, tax, planning, areas of low public trust, it starts to fall into the same area. I think where you can start to expand a conversation and give governments a, a greater sense of we've considered this and there's alternate options, but some things are just hard and as, as something to have looked at across the spectrum, all courses of action will get you criticised. We see it in a range of issues and this is another low trust I'm area. I'm going to go yeah, back to you um, on the previous uh, question really and that is whether a jury system, uh, whether a, a jury of Australians uh, would come up with uh, potential solutions to something like this or whether they might reflect a general prejudice? Very rarely, I'm going to say never, do we see a general prejudice. I get the question from elected representatives all the time, if I let citizens go at this issue, pick your area. They won't like old people, they'll cancel Meals on Wheels and it just never happens. We exist as a research foundation for this reason to test it out and we've never seen a group of people come back and act frankly, out of pure self-interest and beggar thy neighbour somewhere else. It's an awful thing to sit here and say, yes, we could do it better. It is an invidious task facing whichever person in government lands with this. Can a complementary role be played? Perhaps. But the last thing I want to do is sit here and say, you know, there's a, there's a silver bullet to be fired. There's not. But there is an expansion in the way we make public decisions, because what is coming out very clearly is there is no trust. All right, let's go to, we've got time for one last question. This one comes from Andrew Palmer. Hi. Um, a few years ago, John Oliver did a segment on the gun control legislation that was introduced in the wake of the Port Arthur massacre. And as part of that, he asked uh, an American politician and an Australian politician the question, what makes a politician successful? The American politician reply, replied, getting re-elected, while the Australian politician re replied, making society a better place. Has politics in Australia reached the point now where politicians are unwilling to take a stand on important but divisive issues for fear of damaging their chances of re-election? Yeah, uh, go ahead, Ian. Uh, Andrew, your question goes to, I think, uh, one of those general curiosities of, well, if so many people want something to change, you know, there's many issues where there's perhaps 80% public support. We hear it about uh, euthanasia laws, we hear it about marriage equality. 80%, a large number of the electorate wants something to change, why doesn't it move? Electoral systems don't run on 80%. They run on the 1.5% who will get so profoundly irritated by something that they'll change their primary vote. Liquor regulation, alcohol regulation, Australians don't like to be told mm. when they can have a drink. Mm. You may see general 60%, 70% support. It's not about the 70%. It's that 1.5% who will move. Marriage equality laws will extremely motivate people at different ends of the spectrum. So that middle bulge of support doesn't matter so much. So... Yeah, I think, the, um, I think a little bit of each in terms of getting elected and doing good things, but the incentives are very acute and moving 1% moves electoral systems. You know, actually, it brings us almost back to the beginning, Laura.